Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our readings for this Sunday, which is the um, baptism of our Lord on January 7th, 2024. Uh, we begin with our first reading, Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5, the 29th Psalm. Our second reading is Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And our gospel is Mark 1, verses 4 through 11. And for those of you who are looking for uh, the Epiphany readings, we have a separate podcast for that. And uh, so we invite you to take a look at those. Well, happy Baptism of Our Lord Sunday. This all. is a huge day. This is a huge day in some traditions. Indeed. Say more, Matt. Well, I learned this when I stumbled upon a gathering of various Orthodox traditions at the Jordan River on Baptism of Our Lord Day. And it was, I think the, the, the ecclesial term is a madhouse. I heard it's, <laughs> it's gazillions of people there. Ecclesial is, chaos? Yeah, which is when this uh, kind of casual low church Protestant all of a sudden discovered that other people <laughs> think this is a really big deal. Uh, and it is, as I've learned since, this is more important than Christmas or even Easter, I think, in some traditions. This mm. is when mm. this is when the Holy Spirit busts in and Jesus gets to work. This is when the world changes. Yes. Well, and that is one of the distinguishing features, right, of this. I mean, we could easily overlook that uh, in terms of John baptizing in the wilderness. and But that distinction of, I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then of course the Holy Spirit descends from the ripped apart heavens like a dove and, and enters into Jesus. And so that is that distinguishing. And we kind of assume that, I think we just kind of, oh yeah, but you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and you know my tradition, Mark with the cross of Christ forever. But that is the distinguishing feature here of, of Jesus baptism and how Jesus will baptize and and if we bring in, you know, if we bring in the Genesis text, that's the connection, uh, all the kinds of connections back to, you know, new creation and what that invites theologically and imaginatively about how we think about baptism and the importance of baptism in our own lives and our own traditions uh, and and how we open up conversation and thinking about what is the meaning of baptism, which, which we talk about every time we do this, this Sunday, but uh, not that you want to have a you know a sermon a doctrinal sermon on baptism at least I don't want to hear that but uh, but how is it that we uh, particularly here with the with the promise of the Spirit and that that distinguishing feature of Jesus baptism is significant. So maybe a doctrinal sermon on on the Trinity? No, that would be the wrong Sunday. <laughs> but I think you have it to is. Wait a few more Sundays for that, Joy. Oh, gee, I got I got all revved up. Uh, <laughs> now I think it is significant though for us to to take this attention to that ongoing promise of God. Again, uh, as you mentioned, Caroline, bringing in uh, the Genesis text that God's intention for creation, ha God has not given up on. And at this particular moment, we're seeing um, this shift in history um, where after uh, the reality of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and the life and ministry of Jesus, that we are going to know that God has not given up on new creation, and that that is going to be fulfilled. And that work is the creator God, uh, the son of God, and the spirit of God, who are we all have access to. No, what we're touching on, I think, is there is a lot of, I think, unspoken pressure in some churches to make this a sermon about baptism, as if this is Baptism Sunday, which right. it's not. Or about the Trinity, because I think we're so afraid of making a Trinitarian mistake because we have to talk about the Son and the Spirit together and then the voice from the heaven, you know, the assumption is the Father there saying, this is my Son. So we're kind of afraid of that. You know, Matthew's gospel thinks there's a need to explain the baptism, but Mark doesn't. So I would think that this year of all years, Jesus undergoes a baptism for repentance, whatever that means for him. But I would focus on this as um, he, he undergoes, he's endowed here. He's endowed with an authority 
and he's possessed by the Holy Spirit. Um, the Spirit does not land on him, as we've talked about in years past. It goes into him. Correct. Is the preposition just like other unclean spirits possess people in this gospel? Here, the Holy Spirit is possessing Jesus. So I would want to talk about that. That you know we've moved away from the delicacy of Christmas and the romanticism of a baby in a manger. And fulfilled promises, all wonderful, beautiful things. But now when it's time, quote unquote, to get to work, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is endowed with a significant amount of authority and has this, this, this revelatory moment that's that I think really important, right? In terms of how will God now unseat the powers of this world? This is where that happens. And I think our baptisms are similar to that, but I wouldn't want to lose track of that about what makes this baptism such a remarkable moment I, in the, I, what the gospel is going to then go on to tell. Absolutely. And I think uh, that also will be a perfect setup for uh, a, a paying attention to the texts that come that actually talk about the authority of Jesus and how that authority was recognized and therefore received. Uh, so I think that becomes a wonderful thread that, uh, that, that we can take advantage of as we're preaching through Mark. Um, I don't know about you, but it seems to me in my pre in in my listening to sermons, I had heard a lot of sermons about John, uh, a lot of sermons uh, that told me about um, who the baptizer was and uh, the proclamation of of repentance. I wonder if now, in the light of our need to be reacquainted with Jesus and our need for uh, the power from heaven, if I can use that term, uh, that it might be do us well to focus on Jesus and to focus on what is happening to Jesus and therefore what will happen because of Jesus. Uh, I think that would be a great turn, and, and I would lift that up uh, 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 for preachers to consider uh, this season. That's a great point. Yeah. And some of you might have already talked about John back in Advent when we had Mark 1, 1 through 8. So if this text sounds familiar to people, it's you're correct. Um, but yeah, very much so. Um, and, the, and Mark doesn't spend a lot of time on John compared to um, the other three Gospels in particular. I mean, there's nothing about John here that's proclaiming a kind of judgment to come, like we see, especially I think in Matthew and in Luke, but but I think what Mark's proclaiming here is a deliverance, right? One more powerful than I is coming. I mean, all John's doing is pointing ahead, uh, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> which which sounds good until you see what it does to Jesus in terms of driving <laughs> him out into the wilderness and being tested by the devil. And I mean, that's it's it's not a it's not a whatever it means for the Spirit to come down. Uh, what's the exact line here? Uh, like a dove into him. You know, you can hear the harps playing. It looks so gentle and peaceful. A little Mary Pop is it Mary Poppins with doves on her shoulders? What is some movie? I that think Snow White. Snow White. I had a. I didn't watch the right films in my childhood. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I imagine more of a dive bombing kind of kind of bird of prey here. Just. Everybody's screaming, look out! <laughs> Once they see this thing coming Whoa. down. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, too, connected with that is, of course, the ripping apart of the heavens, which, according to the text, only Jesus sees. And so I, I think that's a there's another aspect of homiletically that you could focus on in that, you know, the especially connected to the Genesis text is that the heavens are, you know, the heavens are torn apart, they're ripped apart. There's nothing, we've talked about this, that the world can't go back to the way it was. And, uh, and, and what is it that, you know, what is it that Jesus sees? What is it that Jesus witnesses in that moment? And kind of maybe, maybe hovering, ha ha ha, you know, um, going back to the spirit, get it? The wind. Okay. Uh, and kind of hover or stay in this moment of what this means for not not that we can get into Jesus' head, but this is a very personal account. I mean, it's you are my son, uh, and Jesus is the one who sees this, and 
and then also connected with, uh, you mentioned this, Joy, of the theme of Jesus' authority going forward, the the connection to the Genesis text that the creation of light and what is it then that we will see, you know, in in Epiphany, what will be manifested about Jesus and 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 but also what is Jesus realizing about himself? Oh, what 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 is he seeing about his own uh, his own possession <laughs> uh, by the Spirit that is going to, as you said, take him into the wilderness, but then is also going to uh, propel his ministry. And so there's a, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of imagery you could use with light and uh, and darkness going into Epiphany, and just only that that also uh, beginning realization of what his ministry is. Uh, going to be about, and it's like you said, it's uh, it's a dive bomb dove. <laughs> that that'd be a good title, dive the dive bombing <laughs> dove, uh, and and then right a- and then right after this, of course, Jesus is uh, goes into the into the wilderness. So. Uh, a lot there that maybe we don't necessarily think about when it comes to baptism. <laughs> exactly. exactly, but maybe it it turns the turns the kaleidoscope just a little bit and we get a vision of what baptism is and does and means that uh, maybe we haven't thought about before and um, we'll talk about this in the next few weeks um, there's so much about what our conceptions are our preconceived conceptions are about what uh, these texts are pointing to that sometimes we forget to just read the text and um, I think the challenge for us now uh, is, again, to read the text and let it speak afresh to us. And that might split open some of our preconceived ideas, if I can hover around that image. How's that? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, okay. Okay. Well, that takes us to Genesis. Take a look at, at, at Genesis, because my, my, my punniness has, has fallen flat. <laughs> Laugh with me. So maybe add verses. I'm going to suggest we add verses here mm. uh, to Genesis 1. <clears throat> I mean, you get the reference to the spirit in the waters, obviously. So there's something primal, scary, huge about the baptism and its imagery. <clears throat> but if you add verses 6 through 8, you also get the discussion of the creation of the dome. Mm-hmm. which I think would allow you, if you wanted to talk about what you were talking about, Caroline, the, the tearing of the heavens, this idea of a, of, a, of a separation that earth, the creation is where humanity is meant to dwell and God is up above this dome, up above the waters and the sky. So you can pull people a bit into the ancient cosmology of a God, quote unquote, up there, who belongs up there and we belong down here, which is what makes that rending of the heavens in Mark 1 so potentially terrifying. Yeah. And that, and that, and as the commentary points out, you know, that the other time that the verb is used is at the crucifixion. And so that separation from God uh, is no longer, right? God is no longer in the heavens and compared to the, you know, the imagery of being opened. And so in, in Matthew, and so it is, it can be terrifying. Like, you know, the, the heavens are ripped apart, the, 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 that which separates us from God is no longer could be good news to some and not such good news to others. Like, I don't really want God that close. Uh, I like God in God's little firmament up there. And and I'll let God out every once in a while when I feel like I, 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 I'm I ready or want to uh, have a conversation with God. So, or I need something. Or I need or something, I need right? Something. And, exactly. and so... Yeah. And so there is uh, that the, that closeness of God, the the epiphany of God in Jesus is as close as it gets. And so how is it how is it a, how a sermon then um, how is it a sermon maybe goes in that direction, but also with the Genesis text that that the intimacy of God and creation uh, and that that God that God and creation is not something that happened, you know, 
millions of years ago, but it's this God is consistently, you were, as you were saying, Joy, God is uh, consistently present in, in creating activity and where and how do we see that? How is that being realized, being manifested in this epiphany season? And there's a, um, if I can say an intrusion uh, of God into uh, the midst of everything that is going on, everything that is our current reality, everything that was that uh, current reality, um, what is understandable and what is uh, beyond our conception. Uh, and, and yet God is present and God is active. And um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to the Psalm and, um, and we can go back, but um, this I'm, I'm going to read it literally here where it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength uh, of God. Uh, and in some ways, that's an invitation for us to do just what we're doing, to focus on God's presence and God, God's activity, um, particularly as it becomes manifest in Jesus, so that we are not ascribing to um, the rituals and practices that have become ours, but we are ascribing to the one who keeps intruding into our reality um, so that we want to mark it with some occasion that says we are joining God in what God is doing. We are accepting with God what God is doing on God's terms. And I'll leave that kind of hanging there. Well, and when I was reading the psalm and the repetition of the voice of the Lord, the glory of God, the God of glory thunders, the voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, I'm, it, it, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, and I put that alongside, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought of that, that you are my son, the beloved with you, I am well pleased. It's like, you are my son, the beloved, I love you. You know, I just had this sort of pastoral calming, I don't know what I, I, I don't know if I ever thought of sort of that, that claim on Jesus as this booming, thunderous voice of the Lord that, uh, you know, in case Jesus doesn't hear it. It's going to, it's, you know, it's going to shake the wilderness. Uh, oh, and, yeah, I, and it causes the oaks to the whirl. And so you have this sense of the voice of the Lord and uh, in the wilderness, shaking the wilderness, directed to Jesus along with the ripping part of the heavens. And th there's something just... Um, just so incredibly, uh, <laughs> it's the presence of God, right? Yeah, it's this, yeah. this, like this presence of God that is, that is a theophany even yes. that you can hear God. You can see God at work with the, with the heavens being ripped apart. You can hear the thunderous voice of God and which just all contributes to a scene that is probably far less, uh, pastoral or, uh, or okay. ecclesially acceptable than we thought before. <laughs> Not as yeah. The opening line of Jason Biasi's commentary. Yeah, exactly. Is great artist, right. Loud. This is a loud psalm, and and then you know towards the end where he channels James Luther Mays and talks about right. How do you get the voice from heaven saying this is my son? While well, you've also got uh, the storm saying you know this is my cosmos. Um, the baptism, this is my Christ. It's just really, I think, an effective way of seeing how this fits together. And we might also note that in just a couple of weeks, Jesus is going to cast out an unclean spirit simply by speaking. Yeah. And people are going to be like, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey. And there's something about that voice and the power of divine speech. Acts in January. This is a great, <clears throat> it's a great birthday present for me. <laughs> yes. Uh, we should note that. Happy day before your birthday, Matt. Why, thank you. I didn't have to hint that too, too dramatically. But. Yeah, dramatically yeah, you did very well. That you was did a, very well. Very, very subtle, subtle and, hint there. And an acceptable way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. And so the lectionary knew 
what Matt needed for his birthday, since often his birthday gets shrouded in snow, literally. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, all the decorations are down and everybody's digging in for winter when you get to January 8th. But anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Acts 19, you have to, you don't have to add verses, but you have to know what happens in Acts 18 at, at right. where uh, this man named Apollos, who's a charismatic preacher, and he doesn't quite understand baptism. He only knows John's baptism. And so he's got some deficiencies in his theology, so to speak. And Prisca uh, and Aquila straighten him out, apparently in a very loving, non-confrontational, <laughs> non-public way. Um, so it appears that there's still this, again, baptism is, is, is adapting to something new. So John has his baptism. The baptism we see, for example... Well, in Acts, but I mean, maybe most notable at the end of Matthew's gospel as a distinctively Christian ritual and then eventually a Trinitarian ritual, that's still in flux in the first century where Christian baptism is taking on its identity and what that means in light of Jesus's own baptism and so on. So it makes sense that there would be people who are still trying to figure this whole thing out. And I don't think Acts is explaining this is the one proper way to do baptism, but it's a reminder that baptism is about, Christian baptism is about taking on a new identity in Christ and probably in Christ alone. And exactly. thanks, John, for your work, uh, but Jesus has got it from here. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. I was really taken, when you were when you're talking about that, Matt, uh, that phrase, they replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I think that could be a great entry into the day as well. Mm -hmm. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit and that- <laughs> Might characterize a few denominations uh, that we might represent. <laughs> well, yeah, like, you know, the Lutherans like to say that the Holy Spirit is a shy member of the Trinity, but- uh, but we know we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit and take that back to that distinguishing characteristic of Jesus baptism that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. We have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And what is it that the what is it that that possession of the Holy Spirit enables? It enables Jesus authority. It'll enable his ministry. It enables creation. It brings about creation. It brings about community. It brings about. And so that could be another, I think, homiletical direction one could take just, just based on that question in verse 2.